30 years ago, bio, biomedical engineering was um, a, a convergence of different disciplines uh, to see how we could harness engineering to improve biology. But I think as the decades rolled by, it's very clear now that biomedical engineers are going to play a vital role that will shape everything from how we spend on healthcare, how we deliver healthcare, all the way to how we address some of the most pressing healthcare emergencies of our time. So if you look at some of these stories that appeared in the Straits Times, this one was actually quite recent, just two days ago. Uh, antimicrobial resistance could kill more people than cancer by 2050. How Singapore is tackling the challenge of aging. And if you look at spending, uh, I know we just had budget 2023. I, if you take a look at what's in this green box, rising healthcare costs are expected to drive up government spending in the years ahead. These are the factors that will affect everybody on this call. And I'm actually going to highlight how our department is addressing all of this directly. And I think this is what showcases the importance of biomedical engineering, creating actual solutions that have real world impact. And you're gonna see that real world impact today. So today's talk is actually about interdisciplinary empathy, right? And so I like to kick things off by asking a question to everybody. No worries, I'm not gonna call on anybody for their answers, but I want everybody to just take a moment and think about what the world will look like in about 50 years. Okay, think about what, it's, what the world's going to be like and what challenges we're going to face and what solutions we're going to have. Right, so these are a couple of prompts, right? What's health going to look like? What's health insurance going to look like? Right, we already know that healthcare expenditures are skyrocketing around the world. So will insurance change? Will we be able to afford uh, coverage for these costs? How about food security, right? What will food look like in 50 years? Social security, foreign policy. The environment, the built environment, the buildings we live in. How about mental health? How about the economies? How about how we travel, how we work, how we move ourselves around? These are some questions to think about. And, you know, this is going to happen a lot later than 50 years from now. But when we think about some of these questions like travel and foreign policy, this is some modeling that was done called Pangea Proxima about how the continents will shift and eventually potentially merge. Right, again, this is gonna happen way farther down the road than 50 years. But when all of you think about these challenges, what challenges do you gravitate towards, right? Are there challenges that are not on this list that you think about? And then the next step is, as you think about some of these challenges and if any of you are interested in addressing these challenges, who will you talk to, right? What, what will you go to university for? What will you learn to address this? But once you learn how to address this, who else will you need to talk to to overcome these challenges? These are things to think about, right? I think a lot of us, especially uh, the people in our department often think about what will health look like? Maybe what will food security look like, right? But I think a lot of times as my career has evolved, I start to think about economy. I start to think about foreign policy. I start to think about transportation. And when I do this, I immediately think about what are the other disciplines I have to talk to in order to address solutions for this. And one thing is for sure, biomedical engineers actually will be involved in, if not all of these, virtually all of these. Okay, and I've actually seen it happen, right? And if biomedical engineers will become involved in all of these, we should be prepared to interact deeply with other disciplines that can help us achieve solutions, right? So I'm gonna focus in even a little bit more, okay? I showed you our department uh, a while ago and they are amazing, right? What you're looking at here is actually the team that I lead my own research group. And uh, these are also a team of amazing researchers, many of whom, actually most of whom are biomedical engineers affiliated to the department. Right. And if we're going to address the challenges that we saw in the previous slides, we have to be willing to work boldly across disciplines. All right. And by the way, this is my daughter. She's not on the team. Right. She happened to attend the meal. She's uh, but if you look at everybody else, this is a team that while they're rooted in biomedical engineering, they span expertise from material science to clinical trials to behavioral sciences to insurance. 
right, all the way to biomedical engineering. And they go above and beyond to achieve the outcomes, which I'll show you today. All right, so when you start thinking about your future, right, everybody uh, in this audience, including our professors, including our graduate students, and certainly our undergraduates, there's a couple key words that you will encounter a lot over the next several years. And these are the terms translational and the terms in the term impact, right? And the thing is, these terms mean a lot of different things to different people. 10 years ago, in the context of biomedical engineering, when we thought about the word translational, we would, we would think about engineers speaking to doctors. That was the primary step to bring something into clinical practice. But the reality is it takes a lot more than that interaction to really change the way we deliver healthcare. We're going to hear a lot of uh, people mention impact, but the thing is, what does impact mean to us? And so at NUS Biomedical Engineering, I'll let you know. I'll tell you what, how we define impact and how we define translation. And so that leads us to the term T2, all right? So I don't mean Terminal 2 at Changi Airport. When I say T2, the National Academy of Medicine has defined what they call the T scale. And this is the, the levels of translation, right, that exist. T0 is cells, tissues, and animals. This is work that is primarily fundamental. T1 is when research has made it to human stage. T2 is when work has made it to patients, those who are ill in large trials. And T3 is when you've changed healthcare, right? You've changed the way that medicine is practiced. And T4 is that it's reached such a scale that it's impacting the global population as a whole, right? And when we think about our department and how we define impact, how we want our students to leave their legacy on the world, we want our innovations within BME to reach T2, all right? And so um, during my career, my, my, my work, my collaborations, uh, I myself have traversed the globe, all right? In fact, I'm, as I mentioned, uh, speaking to all of you from on the other side of the world right now. And I don't think there is any other department in the world that had, has reached T2, all right? And the question I'll leave you with is, did our department reach T2? And I think I'll show you today that we very much so did reach T2. We are the only department in the world. In fact, uh, a couple of months ago, we brought in some advisors, uh, people who have advised presidents of nations, uh, people who have founded tens of publicly traded technology companies, and they further assessed that what is happening with our team members here, there's nothing like this in the world. All right, and I'm going to showcase to you what that is. So how do we get there? How do we get to T2? And today you're going to show you're going to see some of the individuals that make this happen. And here's an example of one of the teams that I lead, which is in the Institute for Digital Medicine, which again includes a number of BME staff. The first person we hired into this institute, he actually has a background in insurance, right? And we do this so that we can launch research programs. And these programs have participation from BME undergrads at NUS, right? We wanna make sure if we are going to save lives and we are going to do so at scale, right? In large numbers at T2 level, we need to know how we build the technologies we want to bring to the patients, right? So we have people from insurance, we have people from physiology, we have neuroengineers, we have cognitive neuroscientists, we have oncologists, right? Clinicians, behavioral scientists, to help us understand the population that we're trying to help. And the users of our technologies are not always patients. They can be doctors, they can be nurses, they can be pharmacists, they can be caregivers. We work with professors from NUS Business School to help us think about who will, how will we actually build our innovations into clinical workflows. And we've even had senior executives from the biggest pharma company in the world, Roche, attached to us, right? And I just saw Dr. Matias last week in Singapore. They've attached with us to learn how we do what we do. We work with industrial designers. I spoke to Professor Brian last night from San Diego about a new collaboration we're working on. We have superstars like Dr. Bina in our department who teach things like serious games digital health and beyond. I'll feature some of her work in just a little bit, 
All right. So if we're going to change healthcare, if you are going to change healthcare, if you are going to address food security, if you're going to address the development of new robotics, new biomaterials, or digital medicine, what are the challenges? And in healthcare innovation, we often think of the word empathy as doctor to patient. That's really kind of the only way we think about it. Or we think about showing empathy to the people we designed our innovations for. But the thing is, what about empathy between disciplines? All right. If we are going to work with behavioral scientists, if we're going to work with economists, if we're going to work with social workers, with nurses, with insurers, how do we think about what they go through? And how do they think about what we go through as engineers? Because bridging that interaction, really pushing the boundaries of how we work with other disciplines, we must do that in order to make sure that our innovations really can make it to people. Because it really is about the engineer to doctor interaction, but so much more, right? And, and I'll show you today how we do this in BME. And I'm gonna give you one example that I went through myself. And so I, in my capacity as director of a couple of institutes and as head of BME, I review a lot of large grants for research. And a couple of years ago, before COVID, we at NUS actually hosted some of the most distinguished um, innovators from Australia, including their chief scientists, including people who have developed therapies that have saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives already, right? These are some of the top people, but they came to us. They actually all flew over here to learn how to, to do what we do because within the walls of our institute, we reach T2, all right? And one of the grants I looked at, and this is all public information, I looked at the budget on the grant and there was a helicopter in the budget, okay? There was actually an airplane in the budget, right? And so when we think about biomedical engineering, I, you know, I've never reviewed a grant with a helicopter, someone asking us to, to fund a helicopter, someone asking us to fund a plane, right? In biomedical engineering, we think about people funding materials to make biomaterials or making diagnostics or microchips, et cetera. But this team wanted a helicopter. And the reason they wanted it was because they wanted to build imaging systems into uh, flying uh, vehicles, aircraft, so that they could transport potential stroke patients from the outskirts of Australia. And in that one hour from diagnosis, which is called the golden hour, that's a critical time point where they have to assess and figure out how to treat people who may have had a stroke, because if they get it wrong, this could lead to millions of dollars per person in lifetime medical treatment, right? And so part of this was they were requesting helicopters and planes to fit and engineer imaging systems inside, right? And for me to understand this, I had to really go in and start studying about aircraft, right? Uh, and, and how imaging systems are used now. I had to learn about the, the geography of Australia. And if I flip the script and we think about all of you, some of you, Many of you may be engineering healthcare solutions. And while we will certainly focus on helping Singaporeans and our region here, if we want to further our reach to other parts of the world, we will also be thinking about how different countries' geographies dictate how healthcare is delivered. In fact, there are parts of Australia where the nearest major healthcare, tier, uh, you know, tier one healthcare that can handle stroke are hours away from where people live, right? That's not something we would relate to in Singapore, but it's something we need to understand. So when I showed you that image earlier of what earth will look like 50 years from now, and I mentioned transportation, healthcare is very much involved with that, right? So this is that was one of my journeys in learning about disciplines I had no idea about going in. And so here's a brief outline of what we're gonna talk about. And uh, I'm gonna showcase some real examples of some of the innovations that we're, we're bringing to the world at NUS Biomedical Engineering. And I'll mention that we have students in BME, undergrads that have helped with this, all right? So this part of my talk is what I call medicine made for you, all right? So what does this traditionally mean, all right? So medicine made for you, personalized medicine, precision medicine. I think the need for this has virtually impacted every single one of us. And at some point will impact everybody in the world, the need to personalize healthcare. Traditionally, this means giving somebody the right drug at the right dose at the right time. 
This is the widely used phrase. But then for each of these points, I, I counter raise a question, which is, how do you pick the right drugs if you, if you want to give the right drug? Do we use traditional methods? Do we give everybody the same drug? And if you want to give everybody the right dose, what's the right dose? Is it the highest dose possible? And the right dose for an individual on a Monday, I say maybe a different dose the following Monday, right? So how do we continuously give the right dose and what's the right time, right? And so at BME, we're solving some of these problems. So this is an example of what we've developed through our innovations. It was what I call the digital avatar. What you're looking at is information from a single patient, right? And this data here is telling us how two cancer drugs or drugs used for cancer treatment are interacting in only that patient, right? Using nobody else's data. And this digital avatar tells us exactly how to dose this patient to optimize their cancer treatment at exactly the right time. And as this three-dimensional map evolves over time, it allows us to dynamically adjust this dosing. The same avatar tells us what drugs to even give the patient in the first place. And so here's an example of how these curves and how when different drugs are administered, how they evolve over time as the individual evolves over time. This is the first time in the, in, in the world where we've been able to dynamically change dosing for cancer drugs to sustain optimal care, All right? So with this digital avatar, we do something totally different. We use only a patient's own data to manage only their own care. This is not traditional AI where we're amassing large amounts of data from everybody around the world to treat the next person that walks in the room. It's truly individualized. All right. Here's the interesting part. Okay. If we get it right, okay. If we get it right, we will be able to ensure that we can individualize care. But if we get it wrong, if we do things traditionally, this is what happens, okay? Even good drugs given at the wrong dose, okay? So if a patient is getting drugs and they're good, they should work, but the dosing is wrong, the drugs actually may not work at all for the patient, all right? But if you just change the dose, you can actually change, flip these patients into becoming responders to treatment. The drugs can actually work. That's profound because if you think about it, are there patients that we are giving therapies to and they seem to not work, but they can? That's something that we're solving in BME and I'll give you a specific example in just a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna showcase something to you here. Um, about 10 years ago, my colleagues and I had an idea, which was the digital avatar. And we were, we were wanting to use the digital avatar to design drug combinations for cancer patients. And we wanted to dose cancer patients better. And when I went to some of these top oncologists all over the world, I, I received this, this specific answer all the time. No way, we're not gonna do it because that's not how we do it now. Right now, they, they, or back in the day, they used to pick drugs off of what, you know, decades worth of studies would, would say off of mass populations. And then they would just give everybody the same drugs. Okay, so they're like, if you have a, if you think you have a way to pick different drugs, we, we don't, you know, we're going to stick to what we do now. And then I said, well, you know, why are you giving everybody the highest dose possible? It's super toxic for cancer patients, right? I think I have a way, we have a way to like optimize dosing over time that could be better at lower doses. And of course, give you the same answer. No way. When we think about putting disciplines together, right, being interdisciplinary, maybe straightforward, getting disciplines to talk, but driving what I call deep collaboration, where you are working together to actually treat a person when the stakes are high, putting disciplines together to achieve this may not be easy. In fact, it's hard, it's very hard. And so 10 years ago, that's what happened. Let's flash forward several years, okay? This is a few years ago. This was done with a collaborator, Dr. Ed, Professor Ed Chow at BME. What you're looking on the left is that same digital avatar, okay? This is a human patient who had failed six lines of therapy for cancer. This patient was about a week away from entering end of life hospice care, all right? This patient had failed everything. They'd failed advanced immunotherapy, which is the, the most you know uh, widely examined drug out there now. Um, and what happened was a sample of this patient's blood was taken 
and this optimization was run on the blood and a ranked list of combinations was derived experimentally. This is not purely computational using only a patient's own sample to derive regimens only for them. The doctors looked and found a combination they were intrigued with. They gave the patient this combination. We have approval to run these types of trials. And immediately the patient responded to care, made it to transplant, and ultimately went into remission. Okay, this is a human patient in Singapore who was told that it was the end of the line for them. They had failed everything under the sun who then achieved remission using technology developed out of BME. Okay, this is a real world outcome, all right? I'm gonna showcase some more, all right? And I'm gonna go back into oncology in just a little bit. Transplant, all right? Uh, transplant is a prevalent issue. And what happens when a person gets a new organ from transplant, liver, heart, kidney, et cetera, you have to manage immunosuppression, right? You have to make sure they don't reject the organ that they got. And so I'm gonna showcase for each of my examples, the disciplines involved, right? Engineering, physicians, nursing, pharmacy, and beyond. And the issue with immunosuppression is if you give them too much drug, they can have seizures and they have neurotox, et cetera, slurred speech. And if you give them too little drugs, they can reject the organ and then they can, they can die from that, right? And so we published a, a, a an article in a very prestigious journal a few years ago showing that we could optimize uh, this liver transplant. And what was interesting about this is these are different patients that were treated. You can see just how different patients are from each other. Their dosing is always changing. And we discharged our patients a month earlier compared to the standard way of treatment. Uh, when this happens, you save the patients a lot of money. Okay, and you save the healthcare system a lot of money, but forget the money for a moment. These are patients whose immune systems are suppressed because you don't want them to reject the organ. You are getting them out of hospitals faster. And these immunosuppressed patients can actually catch infections in the hospital that can kill them, right? And so when we think about the impact of this, and let's think all the way to that second slide that I showed, improving on healthcare expenditures keeping people out of hospitals when you can get them home faster. This is an exact example of that. These are human patients, real patients, and we are showing that we can get them home faster after transplant. I'm gonna show you a few examples in oncology beyond the one I just showed you. In cancer, patients are always getting the highest dose possible. Super toxic, so toxic that many patients ask to end treatment, right? And they, they choose to stop. And in this case, we ask the question, can we dose them better? More disciplines are involved. Engineering, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, regulatory, implementation. How do we build our dosing with AI into the healthcare system? And can we help save the families and the healthcare system more money, but while delivering better outcomes at the same time? Because the economics will matter, right? It will address what kind of subsidies can go into these technologies and who's going to pay for them. This is a patient that was uh, that approached our team who had advanced prostate cancer, stage four, uh, metastasized to the bone. And this patient was undergoing a two drug treatment and it was so unbearable, they considered quitting this study, which again, they will have run out of options. The patient's dosing was changed a little bit during the treatment because it was such a toxic treatment that we were able to use our AI platform, Curate AI, to map out this digital avatar for the patient. If you take a bird's eye view of this plot here, it showed us that if we drop the dose of one of the drugs by 50%, we could actually increase efficacy. Imagine that you go to an oncologist and say, hey, by the way, can I reduce the dose to increase the efficacy of treatment? And you could imagine what they said at the time, no way, All right? These are some of the top cancer doctors in the world. And so we said, no problem, right? It's, uh, it's, it's your choice. And then ultimately the patient said, look, if I have no more options left, why don't we just try it? So the patient signed the waivers, we got the approval, we dropped the dose 50%, and the patient's cancer markers dropped to the lowest levels they had ever seen during the course of treatment. There was no other patient on the planet getting a dose this low for this drug. And it actually increased their efficacy and actually resumed an active lifestyle. Over the course of treatment, we started modulating the dose, a little bit of an increase, a little bit of a decrease, but way below what other people were getting. 
this completely counters the tradition, the, the, the knowledge that you have to give everybody the highest dose possible. In fact, the higher they went on this patient, the worse they got. Right. And this was using AI to guide oncology dosing based off of efficacy, first in the world from NUS BME. Not long after that, we were approached by another patient from TTSH. This patient had stopped responding to any type of cancer therapy. This is advanced gastric cancer, stomach cancer. The doctors had said, this is the end of the line. Every time this patient was being dosed with a cancer drug, they were being warded back in the hospital due to liver failure. So we used Curate, we started designing a study, and within a few weeks, the patient's doctor called me and started responding to treatment, unprecedented at a lower dose, right? And at this lower dose, we started doing calculations and we showed that we were saving the patient tens of thousands of dollars. Lower dose, better outcome, right? We had since scaled up this treatment to even more patients at NUH, all right? And so these are multiple patients. It's a much larger study that's happening. And what happened was these are solid cancer patients with colorectal cancer. And this was a very profound outcome. We had a patient in particular who was not responding to care at all, right? They, they were not responding. The cancer markers were getting worse. And when we dropped the dose on this patient, they actually flipped from non-responder to responder, okay? In cancer treatment, all the time, patients get a cancer drug and it seems like they can't respond at all. It doesn't work. So they move them to something else, right? They move them to another treatment until they run out of options. Good drugs, as I showed earlier, good drugs given at the wrong dose, it can seem like the treatment cannot work for the patient, but just by using their own avatar to adjust the dose and understand how they uniquely respond, we've achieved late life-saving outcomes from this as well. You might look at the bottom of the screen. What is ASCO? The American Society of Clinical Oncology is arguably among the most prestigious medical conferences in the world. All right. And these medical conferences are so hard to get into, right? When you submit innovation that Typically, most people are allowed to present a poster of their work, and they just post it online. That's it. People can go online and view the poster of the work. To be allowed to show up to the meeting in person in Chicago and present is among the most prestigious achievements in the area of cancer treatment innovation. Last year, our team at NUSBME, this is the first time that a treatment trial from a BME technology was ever invited to present on site at ASCO. Right? You're talking about 30,000 oncologists from around the world showing up, right? In fact, global stock markets move during that week based upon what is reported at ASCO. All, all industries are impacted by what happens at ASCO, right? And first time that a treatment technology from BME at NUS was ever invited to present. And in fact, we're invited to present again next summer. It's unprecedented. I would argue that probably most BME departments in the world have never presented a new technology that made it to patients in-house. This is what happens when different disciplines come together. Since we're still emerging out of a pandemic, let's take another look at what we did out of BME. Right? Even more disciplines, including epidemiology and analytics and the business school, brought into this. This is a team of biomedical engineers from NUS and others from around the world. This work, what we call Identify, this is an AI platform we developed starting in 2019, okay, way before the pandemic. We asked ourselves, we said, hey, look, we're, we're treating cancer patients most of the time. What if a, a pandemic were to ever happen? Because if a pandemic ever hits the globe, things happen quickly. People die quickly. We have no options. And from this paper, which we started in 2019, we made this conclusion that if a pandemic arises, we better come up with inexpensive treatments, interventions or treatments, because healthcare systems and industry will be overwhelmed during a pandemic. All right, we published this in 2020. These, there are people from KPMG Singapore on this team, people who developed Ebola drug combinations, NUS business professors, BME professors, BME staff. We did this work and developed Identify, which 
later on during the course of COVID, because of our work, we ended up working with the amazing infectious disease community in Singapore, DSO National Labs, NCID and others came up with Identify, had access to the live virus, developed new combinations for beta variant, delta variant, Omicron variant. And because of the promise of this technology, it will be featured in a major WHO report as one of the two only examples of real world use cases. Again, the only two examples of real world use cases of AI for treatment, both from Singapore, both from NUS Biomedical Engineering. And based upon the promise of this technology, we are now addressing antimicrobial resistance, bugs that have extraordinarily high fatality rates, right? Some, some of them above 90%. And we're addressing this, and as I showed in that second slide about how AMR, antimicrobial resistance, may kill more people than cancer by 2050, and US BMEs already pioneering new work in this space. We have had undergraduates work with us across all of these technologies. And many of our undergraduates have gone on to join our team as research assistants and pioneer their own innovations, patent their own innovations, and also achieve life-saving outcomes. So who are these biomedical engineers? On, on was an NUS BME undergrad. And what I'm so proud of is she is now leading a clinical trial to use AI to optimize blood pressure dosing in patients at Alexandra Hospital and NUH, right? She's only about three years out of undergrad. And she actually was one of the co-first authors of some of that life-saving oncology work. She is from NUS BME. Shubay, also um, a BME alum, she worked with me directly and Dr. Agata, who's also a BME uh, assistant professor, to address m all of those cancer patients we just talked about, right? And it is amazing to see these students take what they do from BME to save lives in Singapore and the world, right? So 20 years ago, people would ask, what's a biomedical engineer? They represent exactly what the future of BME is and the present day of BME is, which is developing innovative technologies, first in kind, to achieve life-saving outcomes, and to think about how we can actually integrate them into real-world use. Dr. Alex, also in BME, and we've had the privilege of working with some of the top clinicians in the world, David, Rishi, another David, and many of you have seen the two Davids, David Lai, David Michael Allen, and their commentary on the pandemic, right? Um, and, uh, and they are world leaders in the space, as well as Louis Chai, right? And so, this is an integration of so many different disciplines, right? To, to, to get our work done, real privilege. And to showcase the real world impact, we're now getting questions from the clinical community. You know, hey, I've got a new drug I'm thinking about for COVID. Can you check to see if we can make combinations with it? Which drug appeared in most of the good combos that showed up? How did this other drug rank? We are now being approached by clinical communities from around the world, right? Based upon identify powered by BME. For those interested on what's next, as I mentioned, this work will appear in a WHO report in the coming month or two. This has been supported by some of the largest companies in the world. And by the way, our team didn't stop there. We actually made a comic book. We actually made a comic book that's available for free download at, at this link. Um, and uh, it's, it's about using AI to address a character that we call Vinny the Virus. And we actually did not make this book in response to the pandemic. We actually developed this about four and a half years ago. Um, and uh, it's actually at every library branch in Singapore. And uh, for those of you interested, let us know, send us a note. We actually have about a thousand hard copies sitting in our institute right now. We printed about 1500 or 2000 of them that showed up February of 2020. So you can imagine everything shut down after that. We haven't had a chance to give them all out. We have a lot of free copies available, but free download as well. All right, so I'm gonna showcase our final example. Uh, digital therapeutics. What are digital therapeutics? And you can see just how many different disciplines are involved in this. It's actually a cognitive gaming tool powered by Curate AI to optimize cognitive performance. And this involves serious gaming. So Dr. Bina Rai from our department's working on this. 
user interface, user experience from the Division of Industrial Design at MUS, interaction design, all of the above. This is a game developed by NASA. It's like a multitasking game, right? And uh, we integrated our AI platform to dynamically not change the dose, right? This is a digital intervention, digital treatment, but to modulate the difficulty level of each one. And from this, we were able to then craft digital avatars for everybody participating. And we are in the process of running hundreds of users on this, and we've got amazing outcomes. And we actually brought in a former animator from Lucasfilm to help reimagine the game. And this is a, a new field called digital therapeutics, right? And this is a way to keep patients at home for certain conditions where we can remotely train them to improve cognitive outcomes. And we can also remotely track how they're doing, right? So we go back to slide two again, increasing healthcare costs. We can combat that. We can combat aging, which was the second article I showed by developing technologies like this. And this is a first in kind technology that we've developed. Bridging across disciplines. We have to understand the communities we wanna impact. So our behavioral sciences team runs studies where we can interview and engage with communities such as seniors, such as caregivers, exploring digital health, right? To safeguard the health of pregnancy, right? And so, we have these studies going on, and this is very unique for BME departments to make sure we are engaging all of the right disciplines and all of the right individuals that we have to talk to. We have a huge network of disciplines built with BME to make sure we are building technologies that will impact people. I want to showcase one example of how we are also changing practice in education. Dr. Bina Rai, one of our superstars who teaches uh, serious gaming, who looks at digital health, right? She's one of our top educators in the department, recently published this paper in the Journal of Applied Learning and Teaching. She had a co-creation day in Queenstown, a co-design day. What you're looking at are residents of Queenstown working with our biomedical engineers, students from all levels, to come up with solutions together to address aging challenges, these brainstorming sessions. And she published this to teach others how to do this. And from this, we have had real innovations developed, right? And so I'm gonna conclude and then kind of talk about what's next. I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up. I think I've shown you a lot of interesting things, right? I think we've been, we've been helping patients, taking patients with no options, finding them options, powered by biomedical engineering, powered by our own people. Our department comes up with new technology and we put it into practice, but where else can we go, right? Why am I showing you a photo of a plant, right? And so what have we learned as biomedical engineers to now do other things like rethink planetary health, right? Sustainability is an important area, especially for the generation that's listening right now. And I don't know if everybody knows this, but healthcare is one of the biggest carbon emitters on the planet, all right? And so what lessons can we learn to give back to our planet in a practical real world way? So I've shown you optimizing combinations with AI to shrink cancers. I've shown you optimizing combinations to prevent COVID infection. I've shown you how to use dosing to also shrink cancers. Can we optimize combinations to go the other direction, to go upward? So we took our technology and we started optimizing ingredients to put into peat moss, into soil growth media to increase the yield of spinach growth, right? To go the other direction. With a very simple experiment, we actually increased the yield of spinach by 30%, but even more profound, there was no reduction in nutrition content. We used less ingredients to increase the yield and not impact the nutrition. This is how we address food security with lessons learned from BME. We actually since have taken these combinations and increased the yield of other plants by 200%. Right? We've actually met with global leaders who have actually taken this to heads of state to think about implementing this in other countries. If you think about my earlier slide about what earth will be like in 50 years in foreign policy, right? Innovation is a way that we can bridge our ideas with other countries to help make sure we build a better earth. And we're doing that with lessons learned from biomedical engineering with real world practical outcome. 
And what's really fun is Dr. Jennifer Young, one of our newest professors, just launched a course on food technology through BME Learning, right? And so a, bit, a pioneering class, first of its kind. So as we wrap up, I want everybody to kind of revisit this again. Same slide, all right? What do you think the world's gonna be like in 50 years? Because everybody on this call will be building the world we're gonna have in 50 years. And when we think about the solutions, the ideas that we have, how we will train biomedical engineers, we're building the future leaders that will overcome these challenges. And they will overcome them by also having a deep understanding of how to engage with other disciplines so that we don't only come up with the ideas, that we figure out ways to build them into the workflows of real world practice and implementation. All right, so I always tell people this, if you really want to innovate, if you really wanna change the world, if you really wanna do things like develop new technologies to save lives, we have to be willing to admit what we don't know, right? We build some of the most talented biomedical engineers in the world. I just got some good news last week. Some of our, some of our uh, batch of uh, biomedical engineers that graduated a year ago, two years ago, they have been accepted to some of the top PhD programs in the world this year. It's an unprecedented admission cycle. They will become the top biomedical engineers in the world. But what they know going out in having now led trials before they even started graduate school is that they need the help from other disciplines. And we will provide them with the skills. We have provided them with the skills on how to interact with these disciplines. That's how they ended up building these clinical trials and seeing them to success. So I'm gonna uh, conclude with the last two slides. Uh, one of which is in that very beginning, I talked about T2. Okay, did our department ever reach T2 impact? And the answer is yes. What you're looking at here, and don't worry, I'm not gonna go over the numbers, is these are clinical trials registered with clinicaltrials.gov. This is the official database where patients from around the world can go and search for trials that may save their life. And we register these trials because it holds us to a higher standard of reporting our outcomes. Um, and it makes our trials available to people who need help. And it's also good, it's, it's also one of the best practices, right? And so I wanted to note that um, our department has pioneered over 14 first in kind clinical trials. We are by, we, this is by far the most of any department in the world, right? These are interventional trials. These are treatment driven and many of them are powered by our own graduates and even students who are interning with us. Right, and this is unprecedented. Everything from digital therapy to brain cancer, to blood cancer, to liver transplant and beyond, right? I'm deeply proud of our team. There's no other team like it and they've achieved this, which is unprecedented. So how, where do we go from here? We didn't end there, okay? So our department has clearly innovated new technologies, but we're also probably among the few, if not the only departments in the world that has our own social impact arm, known as BME for good or Be Good. And with this, uh, Dr. James Ka, one of our talented educators, developed a course called Geron Technology for Aging. It's actually taken during the undergraduate years and students come up with solutions. We actually have them not only prototype the solutions, but some of these solutions actually reach manufacturing scale and are now deployed in the community in Singapore. Makan Together was developed for visually impaired people to feed more easily, to eliminate food wastage and to allow them to enjoy their food as everybody else does. A couple of years ago, they encountered a gentleman who had was eating alone and their food was all mashed together because this gentleman could not see what he was eating clearly enough. So he didn't want to miss what to eat and didn't want to spill. And that was heartbreaking. And so our team came in and designed this, uh, this product which includes also a drink holder. The individual was spilling his drink often, and this is deployed in the hundreds now, right? It's actually a winner of a major innovation challenge developed by our students, scaled up, manufactured, and now deployed. We have rehab bot, which is a robot that helps those doing rehabilitation work. It's already built. It's already built and it's actually housed within our BME department, as well as iPush, 
right? Those who traditionally have not been able to be mobile on their own in the wheelchairs, they're always pushed. Now they're able to do this themselves. These are real solutions developed by our, our students. And we even have the means now to hire some of them at graduation to see these through to even larger scale. This is BME for good or be good, a, a social impact arm of our department. All right, so with that, I wanted to acknowledge all the amazing individuals that make our work possible. Clinicians from around the world, from Singapore, our amazing NUS community, and of course our BME community. And with that, for everybody, here's an email address for me. This is my direct email. If anybody has questions, feel free to uh, feel free to message me, and I'm happy to answer. And anybody on Twitter, please feel free to reach out at any time. All right, it's been a pleasure speaking with everybody today, and uh, I, I wanted to thank everybody again for those who joined a little bit later. I'm deeply grateful to everybody for joining a bit early today. Uh, I apologize. I'm I'm uh, I'm speaking to everybody from the other side of the world. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, we're really excited to build a first in kind BME department in the world. And uh, we hope everybody joins us for the journey. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor. I think there's a couple way to answer questions. Yes, uh, maybe uh, if anybody wants to speak up over the uh, uh, verbally, or probably we can put questions in the chat as well. Yeah. Give everybody a couple minutes if there's anything being typed. Feel free, please feel free to ask questions. We have a little bit of time. I'm happy to answer any, this is a good time. Oh, let's see what we got. Yes, I will flash the contact information. Once again, happy to do that. And, you know, we'll go ahead and uh, if uh, Ray or somebody wants to put it in the chat as well, we can do that. B-I-E-D-H at N-U-S dot E-D-U dot S-G. B-I-E-D-H at N-U-S dot E-D-U dot S-G. I think I can go ahead and leave this up here. Thank you, Jim Wan. And please do feel free to email me if there are any questions about our program, what students do all of the above. Thank you so much for putting that up there as well. Yes, good question. Um, so it was earlier I'd mentioned that healthcare is one of the world's biggest carbon emitters. And actually, uh, there, there are a number of sustainability challenges. Uh, one of them is actually anesthesia. Okay, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a particular gas that's used for uh, general anesthesia and it, they, they call it the, the Ferrari of, of anesthesia gases, right? It, it allows people to go to sleep quickly and it has a less side effects when they emerge out of surgery. But the, this, is, this was uh, fascinating. For a single doctor, uh, anesthesiologist who does one day's worth of uh, surgeries on one patient, basically, they're emitting in total the same amount is if I think if you drove from Singapore to Shanghai and back or something like that, right? That that's how much um, uh, impact on the on the environment that it has. And I, I calculate. I mean, we know it takes a long time to if you're if you're going to drive that far. And so it's quite a big polluter. And some of the questions we get are: Are there better ways to dose this anesthesia? Of course, you never want to underdose anesthesia, but there are better ways to dose it. And things like AI can help with that. Um, What's really cool is the School of Medicine at NUS held an inaugural uh, sustainability in healthcare workshop. And I was there. A, a couple of our BME team members were there. We were invited to show up because we are going to develop solutions for this, right? Um, when we think about food service in healthcare, when we think about the waste that is generated from all of the consumables, um, there are things to consider, right? About um, how much pollution is generated by the field. And what's so progressive is that um, our, our medical school has created from that workshop a sustainability center in healthcare. Um, and BME is going to play a huge part in that because when new technological solutions are needing to be developed, we're going to be there. That's why they want us there, right? There's a very traditional thought 
from back in the day that biomedical engineering is there to repair and procure equipment used in hospitals. That's actually hospital biomedical engineering. It's actually a different field. Our students are creating the new technologies that will change the way that healthcare is practiced, right? They will be joining companies that are transforming the way that we personalize medicine for patients, that we do cell analysis, that we, how we develop new therapies, right? So that is the BME that we build. And that's why our students are in demand. Hopefully that answers your question. Happy to answer more questions. I, I love this question. So uh, what is the one skill that was learned um, that I think has benefited me the most? Um, and I think that, you know, what's, what's I, I think our biomedical engineers uh, kind of sit in different parts of the universe simultaneously. Like, I, I, wanna, I wanna differentiate this. The, the, the 30 year old definition of, uh, and I'll make sure I answer all of these questions. The 30 year old definition of BME was that biomedical engineers know a little bit about a lot. Okay, and I think that's, that was a, an older vision of BME, but BME now is very different, right? These are students who take in core skills, but the, what's expected of them is, is what, what I call, you know, driven by deep collaboration, right? The, B, the biomedical engineers are creating the solutions that will save lives, address AMR, et cetera. And I think what's, what's really exciting about biomedical engineering is, is the perspectives that we emerge from BME with, right? We can think, you know, I tell people as a biomedical engineer, you can think as 100% engineer. But you can think of, you can also think of, you know, an added a 50% clinical uh, viewpoint. You add 50% implementation sciences viewpoint, right? So the biomedical engineer is not 100% person comprised of just small percentages of everything. A biomedical engineer really can speak in context with so many disciplines out there. And, to, and as you've seen, create real world impact, right? I think it's, the, it's really, fascinating how our students can quickly speak to clinicians, can quickly speak to manufacturing engineers, the scale up production, right? And so, uh, so I'm fascinated by that, probably the best skill to emerge from, all of those perspectives generating real world impact. All right, another question. Um, how do we go about the R&D, persuaded organizations for funding, curate innovation? Uh, how do we get funded? Great question. We are funded by foundations. We are funded by uh, government agencies, um, and uh, we actually collaborate with other companies as well, which is really exciting. These are students working on this can see this work take, take shape, come to life, but also speak to companies at the same time. Um, and what was really cool about this is Curate AI is a small data platform. It's actually very inexpensive to run, and we can do it on a laptop. We don't need supercomputers. Uh, and, and that's what's amazing about it. That's why companies like it. That's why grantors like it. And so our students get to a front row seat to all of this, right? Uh, since it appears to be heavily changing drug amounts, how will this affect drug production? A great question. So, um, uh, so actually to answer this in two parts. So as I mentioned, it's very small amounts of data to build a profile, right? It's actually vary the drug dose a few times, which is allowed. It's done already in many types of uh, clinical practice and you measure the biomarker response. Our AI uses that small data to make the profile. So actually the cost increase would be negligible. And we've actually vetted this with um, a lot of seasoned uh, executives in the healthcare industry. And actually, this is a great question. I would say a decade ago, Pharma may have had a huge problem if we were dropping the doses. But the thing is, remember that patient I talked about who appeared to not respond, but actually respond, right? Imagine how happy the drug companies are because it appeared the patient would not be able to be on that drug. But even at a lower dose, the patient totally can be on that drug for months, even years in some cases. So actually pharma is very much in favor of this. Right. And so I think somebody who appeared to not be able to use their drug is actually doing really well on it. Thank you. Um, that by my conjuring is becoming more interdisciplinary. How is BME taught in NUS to encourage the interconnection between disciplines? Great question. So um, I think we, we certainly have our own uh, our own core courses, right? With biomaterials, bioinstrumentation, thermodynamics. But what's so exciting is that 
we are already bringing in uh, joint appointments of other colleagues from not only uh, uh, design, for example, but actually the, the head of Department of Industrial Design is now appointed in BME as well, right? We have clinicians, the first clinicians ever appointed into BME, but that's not it, right? We have um, Be Good, which is allowing our students to go and seek guidance from so many other disciplines, again, from manufacturing, from the economic side, from the business side. And not only that, our studies are now integrating communications and new media, right? Implementation sciences. These are in user interface and user experience, all of which are very popular uh, job sectors too right now. We want our students to use real world projects to interact with these disciplines. It's very different than our students kind of talking to friends from other disciplines, which is cool too. But in the process of engineering a real world outcome, with new technology, how we then speak to these disciplines and learn from them becomes very profound, right? A very different experience. And so we are using real world impact to be the educational experience. And we are bringing in digital health experts, serious gaming experts, um, health economists and beyond, entrepreneurs, clinicians to make sure our students get real world uh, advice. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, digital aspects. Uh, other than digital, what are other common applications? Great question. In fact, I'll speak from personal experience and experiences with my colleagues. Uh, I was not in digital health uh, during my whole career. I actually started in nanotechnology. Um, my team developed a nano therapeutic called Nano Diamond, small carbon particles, super inexpensive to make. And we use them to deliver cancer therapies more safely. We actually took uh, nano diamonds into clinical trials. Um, it was one of the few in trials in the world at the time. We have colleagues working in robotics. Uh, Professor Ray Yao, who's actually on the call working in robotics. We have biomaterials, looking at regenerative medicine. Um, uh, Prof. Uh, Hao Yong is working in re also in working in uh, not only rehabilitation robotics, but in uh, workforce robotics. Um, and uh, really exciting work there. We have those working in mechanobiology, um, diagnostics, Prof. C.T. Lim, Xiao uh, Huiling, and then um, those working in uh, tissue culture to build better ways to screen therapies. So we have so many different areas that colleagues are working on, um, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful group, right? So uh, hopefully I've given everybody a chance to kind of think about what BME is, where we take our students in terms of real world impact. And uh, really, I think how much fun we have as a department. Um, and uh, it's a new BME. It's a reimagined BME. And as I've shown you, um, it's first in kind in terms of what we do. Um, and so hopefully everybody's had a chance to take a look at what we've done. And uh, really grateful to everybody for joining us early today as well. Thank you for all the questions. We have now come to the end of this event, and we hope all participants were able to enjoy and gain insights after this session. Of course, we would like to thank Prof. Dean Ho for spending your precious time with us today. <clears throat> uh, please join the BME Masterclass Telegram group. And if no one has any more questions, we can wrap it up by providing us some feedbacks for this event. Thank you so much for attending today's event again and have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks to the BME Club for hosting. They're a great crew. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.